and according to the book of enoch and this was the er, this was the understanding the universal belief of the early church the early christian church for the first four centuries after the crucifixion and resurrection of jesus was that demons were the spirits of the giants the nephilim destroyed in the flood and according to enoch these spirits were condemned to wander the earth tormenting humanity without incurring judgment that was sort of like the penalty on humanity for agreeing to their terms yes we will trade you the women's for the secret knowledge these demons apparently still have contact with their parents down in the abyss that's now again this is speculation because the bible doesn't tell us we don't know for sure but that would be the only explanation that makes sense to me is that they're still in contact with these entities in the abyss and running messages back and forth and running messages back and forth and running messages back and forth hey welcome back to blurry creatures this week we have Derek Gilbert author and researcher an awesome guy. Derek is one of the most genuine dudes in this space. Super cool guy, super smart. Hopefully you can hang with him. He goes fast. So get ready. But uh, thanks for tuning in to Blurry Creatures, a podcast about creatures. And we relate it all through the Bible and try to give you guys better answers out there to like some mysteries like Bigfoot and all the ancient creatures that, where do they come from? And in order to do that, figure that out, we have to go back to the ancient world. And ask some hard questions of, where does this stuff spawn from? And is it all related? And this podcast has gotten heavy into theology, way more than I ever thought. But uh, we appreciate you guys being along this journey with us. If you want to support this podcast, go to blurrycreatures.com slash members and help us make more episodes and do this full time. That's the dream. That's the goal. And we're growing and uh, every day someone will share something and how this podcast has impacted their life. And honestly, these messages we're getting are, are hard to read sometimes because they're, so, um, they're just so overwhelming. Like, wow, uh, we just two dudes talking about <laughs> Bigfoot and who knew. But we appreciate you guys out there. Seriously, everyone who supports the show. It's been a heck of a season for Luke and I um, in a lot of ways. So... Anyone who signs up and supports the show just gives us a little jolt of energy to keep going. Can't say thank you enough. So let's get Derek on the show, and thank you guys for everything. The history of our Earth is so different from what we can imagine. Enjoy the journey. The Smithsonian, that if they found out about a large skeleton somewhere, was to go get it. I'm going to assume at least one person is right, because if one person's right, it busts the paradigm. It all goes back to the fallen chair. And the problem with the modern day church, they have a very truncated view of the supernatural. This backdrop is just pregnant with all kinds of meaning associated with this Mount Hermon event. And this guy defects from the kingdom. That's a big deal. Well, welcome back to the show, Derek. Thanks for coming on. You, you You've written a new book. We can just hop right in because this is when the good stuff happens. Um, the Second Coming of Saturn. The, the book's out. Where can we find the book? On your website or Amazon? or where ha- uh, Amazon, uh, Barnes & Noble. Uh, SkywatchTVStore.com has the hard copy. And obviously, Skywatch TV and through Skywatch TV, Whispering Ponies Ranch and the work that we do with uh, Royal Family Kids for Kids in Foster Care. Um, get a better cut that way than if you go through Amazon or Barnes & Noble. But uh if you need an electronic version, uh, it's available in Kindle, and you can get that from Amazon. And uh, obviously, that's instant access, and you don't don't have to pay for shipping. Yeah, it's even in bookstores, which blows my mind. And you know, going into a one of the few remaining Barnes and Noble stores out there and seeing uh, you know a selection of Defender Publishing authors, uh, including my own books, on an actual bookstore shelf, that was really mind blowing. That's awesome. My right? mother doesn't quite understand what it is that we write about, but she was really proud to see her yeah. son's uh, you know work there on the bookshelf. That was pretty cool. <laughs> Dude, I, I know I know that feeling like I remember when I didn't the first time I saw my album at T- Tower Records I was like 
let's go, let's go. <laughs> and that was like the end of that was the end of records being in stores. They were only in stores for a few more years after that, but mm-hmm. they, there was only like three copies. But hey, there was there was a copy. Yeah. So I know Making that feeling. Making it into Tower Records, though, that's, a, that's a deal. Yeah, Tower Records was, uh, that was a, a place to go, just to go, just like bookstores used to be. Tower yeah. Records. I was just talking to a buddy about, about Best Buy. Do you remember Best Buy when it was like 80% CDs and there was maybe like yeah. three TVs and some other things and the whole yeah. store was, mm-hmm. now you have to like look for it and it's half of a half of an aisle. You yeah. know, there's 13 CDs in there, hopefully. Right. <laughs> You're not looking for one. Uh well, Derek, the the new book, so it, it means super timely, right? And I, I the you sent us some copies and a chance to read it, and I think it's a phenomenal book. I recommend it to everybody out there because I think it's it is very very timely. But let's start from the. I mean, I'd love to start from the top. So, um, the second coming of Saturn. The, what we had at the end of twenty twenty is really the sort of the kickoff to this, correct? Like, can you talk a little bit about about why? Why Saturn? And then we can just kind of roll from there. Listeners, if you get in this book, Derek is like a, uh, an encyclopedia of knowledge. And, and the research in this book is, is, so, is so well done that I want to pull on some of these threads today. But I would love to just start about just Jupiter, Saturn, what happened at the end of 2020 and why this is all important. And we're not, you know, we're not just talking about the planets. We're talking about these entities and, and what the, co- the colliding of all these things, really, what that means. Well, if we'd been planning ahead, I would have written this about a year ago so that it came out uh, at the end of 2020. But uh, we had uh, worked on Giants, Gods, and Dragons, and before that veneration, Sharon and I together was kind of in the back of my mind all along because this entity, Saturn, known to the Romans as Saturn, occupies a slot in a pantheon that's been occupied by other entities and other cultures going back to um, the earliest written civilization, Sumer. So I'd wanted to kind of write more about him and research more about him because he kind of got passed over in the previous books as we were dealing with the king of the pantheon was Baal, Zeus, Jupiter, uh, who Jesus identified in Matthew 12 and Revelation 2 as Satan. So we assume that he's the most important character. But this other entity struck me as, as one who was not getting enough attention. And it dawned on me finally toward the end of last year, hey, wait a minute, we got this uh, great conjunction coming up on December 21st, which is the winter solstice, which is a day of some significance in the occult calendar. Uh, hmm. This was the great conjunction or the media, as uh, the media called it, the Christmas star. So hmm. you had the two or two of the brightest planets in the night sky coming Mm. together in the closest observable conjunction in almost 800 years, since 1226. And the significance and the reason that occultists and astrologers and New Agers were paying attention was that this happened at zero degrees of the constellation Aquarius. Now, why is that relevant? Well, you've got the the king star, Jupiter, representing the uh, chief god of the pagan pantheon of ancient Rome, and his dad, whom he deposed and sent to Tartarus, banished him, meeting at zero degrees of Aquarius and inaugurating a new age. We are now finally 50 years after the fifth dimension song in fully the age of Aquarius, which according to astrologers is ruled by Saturn. The constellation is ruled by the planet Saturn, which represents in their minds, a shift to a world that is less materialistic and more decentralized. Hmm. They're looking at this as the the beginning of a, a new world when uh, things will be radically transformed. And it seemed to me that this was not a coincidence as this was happening at the same time. Globalists and uh, the World Economic Forum were pushing for what they called the Great Reset. Right. COVID-19 as mean, gives us a golden opportunity to fundamentally remake global civilization. And of course, one of the hallmarks of their their uh, imagined new world is a world in which you and I will own nothing and we'll be happy It'd about be happy, that. right? Live in our pods and eat our bugs. That's, that's, what, that's what they're saying. Exactly. What's really interesting about all this is that this is very much the way the ancient Saturnalia was described by uh, historians of the classical period. They said this is essentially a time when things were owned in jointly by all. Uh, that uh, the, the reason it was so popular was that slaves suddenly were able to hang out with their masters. The uh, Roman historian Justin, writing in the second century AD, and I'm going to quote this now, the first inhabitants of Italy were the Aborigines, his term, whose king Saturnus, Saturn, is said to have been a man of such extraordinary justice that no one was a slave in his reign mm. or had any private property. 
but all things were common to all and undivided as one estate for the use of everyone. In memory of which way of life, it has been ordained that at the Saturnalia, slaves should everywhere sit down with their masters at the entertainments, the rank of all being made equal. Hmm. This is why it was believed in the classical world that Saturn, or his Greek equivalent, Kronos, ruled over a golden age. So this great conjunction of 2020 in the minds of the astrologers, who now who also call this the great mutation, believe this this is the kickoff to the new golden age so saturn was like he was the original communist right uh, essentially right because he, he yeah. set in, he set in this elite position and then made everybody for one day you can be equal you can all be equal uh we're all the same it's it's it, there are <laughs> no co- the there, lie. there's no coincidences right there's no coincidence this is all i mean this this sounds it's it's crazy this sounds exactly like the fodder that being peddled across the globe by the by the media kind of utopia well exactly right exactly right and and this happened last year right in the middle of what would have been the saturnalia in rome which ran from december 17th to december 23rd so on the winter solstice the 21st we had this conjunction in the sky and i went outside we've got really we, we really don't have much light pollution here out in the ozarks we're, we're way outside the city, so I can see the Milky Way as plain as day. Looked up in the sky. Okay, two bright points of light pretty close together, but not enough to call it the Christmas star. This would not have gotten me on a camel to cross the desert for four months <laughs> uh, like the Magi. The Christmas star was something else again. But the significance is that the astrologers and New Agers are looking at this as the inauguration of a new golden age. Now, this is a reference back to the, the ages of history as defined by the Greek poet Hesiod, who was uh, roughly contemporary with the prophet Isaiah, 8th century BC, 7th century BC. And uh, he wrote that there was a golden age when Kronos ruled in heaven. It was the pre-flood era, Uh, Kronos, the king of the Titans. That was followed by a silver age where things were not quite as good. Humans weren't quite as uh, productive or industrious. They were lazy and slothful. And, And then there was a bronze age. It was really violent and bloody and evil, and it was wicked. And then the current age, which was the iron age, ruled by... Zeus, Jupiter, Hmm. and the gods made life difficult. And so they were longing for a return to the golden age. Wow, that's fascinating. I didn't even thought about it in terms of like the metal ages of, you know, kind of the downgrade from gold to to, to iron. But it kind of reminds me of like Derek from Megalithic Marvels, Luke, when he's talking about how, you know, the construction gets worse over time. And it kind of feels like you could probably lump that bad construction in the in the age of the metal. But how long do you think these ages last, Derek? You know, is there any time frame, you think? I have no idea. Because if, if we call the Golden Age the pre-flood era, I put the, the, the floods somewhere in the 6th millennium BC, sometime before 5000 BC. Then you've got the, the Silver Age, if there is such a thing. Historians, archaeologists kind of use a sim- similar system with the Copper Age following the Stone Age, followed by the Bronze Age, the Iron Age, and then our current uh, Industrial Age. But what's interesting about the uh, those metallic ages is that they correspond to the four metals in the dream of Nebuchadnezzar in the giant statue that he saw with the head of gold representing his kingdom of Babylon, hmm. the uh, the arms of silver and the chest of silver that was representative of the Medes and Persians, and then the uh, the torso of bronze that was the Greek Empire, and then the legs of iron that was uh, Rome. Right. So it was the same four metals, uh, probably not a coincidence. Right. Because again, they were roughly contemporary, living within a century or two of one another, Daniel and uh, and Hesiod. But again, Hesiod put uh, Kronos at the head of this golden age. The Romans uh, took it a step further. They kind of rehabilitated the image of Saturn. And again, for listeners and viewers, it, to, just to be clear, Saturn, Kronos, same entity by different names. And it was understood during the classical era, the Greeks and Romans, the Phoenicians, they called them Baal, Haman, same entity by different names. There are probably eight, nine different names that uh, are are in the book, but they all apply to this same entity. And I kind of trace his career from hmm. the pre-flood era through uh, Armageddon, basically. But uh, th- this belief that this golden age would return and that Saturn, who ruled over the, over the golden age in years past, would come back to reign over that was uh, something that was looked forward to by the Romans of first century BC, the time of the transformation of the Roman Republic into the Roman Empire. 
the poet Virgil, who wrote just after the assassination of Julius Caesar, around 40 BC, wrote a poem called the Fourth Eclogue. Tom Horn has written about this extensively in uh, Zenith, uh, Apollyon Rising 2012, Zenith 2016. Uh, the fourth eclogue where he wrote, uh, justice returns, returns old Saturn's reign with a new breed of men sent down from heaven. It's it's a long poem essentially dedicated to a politician by the name of Gaius uh, Polio, who had just been elected consul, which is the highest elected official in Rome at the time, sort of like the president. Huh. And he's, he was basically saying, you know, because you're a poet, you're not making anything, you got to get sponsors, you know, so you, you you flatter the people who've got money in order to, uh, you know, earn your living. So he was basically writing to Polio and saying that uh, during his reign, this golden age would return. But because Virgil referenced the Cumaean Sibyl, who played a really important role in the founding of Rome, it was sort of like a uh, we, we've got certain founding fathers, certain stories related to the uh, founding of America that we consider important, you know, George Washington and uh, skipping the silver dollar across the Potomac and uh, chopping down the chair, stories like that. Right. The Cumaean Sibyl played a really important role in the founding of Rome. And Virgil, I mean, important enough that a, a set of scrolls that she offered to the last king of Rome before it became the Roman Republic, this would be around uh, 530 BC, somewhere in there were preserved in the temple of Jupiter and consulted by a small group of men who alone had the right to go in and look at these scrolls. Whenever there was a bad omen, like a shooting star in the sky or a two-headed calf was born or something, these guys would go and look at the Cumaean scrolls to find out what they had to do in order to ward off the, the anger of the gods. Because Virgil cited the Cumaean Sibyl, it was taken seriously, this poem, as a prophecy, hmm. even into the Christian era. Emperor Constantine interpreted this prophecy, this new breed of men sent down from heaven, as the prophecy of the birth of Jesus Christ, which it wasn't, but right. that's how it was interpreted. And uh, Virgil's work was uh, considered prophetic, even to the point where, um, you, you know the way some Christians will take a Bible and kind of flop it open to a page and put their finger down and then look at the verse to see what that verse means for them that day. Yeah, Bible roulette, right? Like you play, you, 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 you roll the dice to see what comes up. That, this is, this is my prophecy. <laughs> exactly. People were doing this with Virgil's Aeneid, hmm. which is his epic poem of the founding of Rome, where, you know, Aeneas, who was a survivor of the Trojan war, leads a group of followers from Troy and settles in Italy and eventually winds up finding, uh, founding Rome. It's an alternate uh, origin story for Rome. Uh, people would do that with the Aeneid. They'd flop it open, put the finger down, and that was the prophecy. Even as uh, King Charles II, or King Charles I, rather, who was beheaded by Oliver Cromwell and the, the Roundheads during the uh, English Civil War in the 1640s, hmm. he did that. Uh, prophecy didn't turn out well for him. So, but it sounds like it, Nostradamus almost, Derek. Like like the you people just pull it open and find a quatrain and decide that this is, oh, that looks like, that was like Hitler in, in, uh, in World War II, wasn't it? You know, it's kind of just... It sounds a lot like that. Like you're taking these things and then creating and creating something out of it that isn't. It is. It isn't. Exactly. So, exactly. so just for the slow kids, that that's me, right? I'm uh, I'm trying to catch up here. We we haven't really talked about Saturn. I mean, I know in your book you talk about how Saturn was the leader of the because we talk about Mount Hermon all the time on the show. And that's kind of where our shows lived a lot. Mm -hmm. um, but he was the head of the rebellious Sons of God. Can we talk a little bit about that, why you think this entity sure. started this whole thing? Because we just did an episode with Judd about Mount Hermon. So I think it kind of fits in. We go back mm -hmm. a little bit further and start there. Yeah, Derek, I was going to ask if we could pull that thread like on who, who Saturn is. Because I know that a lot of what... The book is 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 tracking Saturn through the through the ages, but I'd love to go all the way back because because we've talked a lot about the pantheons, right? And, and this idea that there is this uh, in, not divine infernal uh, infernal council, right? And it's these it's the watchers and and this this really bad counterfeit of uh, of what God did, and 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 the book's beautifully beautifully done in, in its mapping, but. I would love to pull that thread if you wouldn't mind, like, and, and take take it back to who is Saturn and, and where does this whole thing sure. come from, and then and then, you know, we can play that thing forward. I know you played all the way to Armageddon. I'd love to talk eventually about some of the things we see now and then maybe looking forward. But 
if we could start and yeah, yeah go well, back I to the beginning. Jump to the, kind of jump to the end there with Virgil yeah, and the whole. Uh, I love it. I love the Vir- but, uh, the Virgil prophecies is, is is crazy in the sense that the whole civil thing and the oracles and, and this it, it feels like a mystery religion almost that they, they would huddle up around these things and then yes. you know and roll the bones and see what happens. Right? I mean, it's the crazy thing is that yeah. you have got uh, modern secret societies like uh, you know the Freemasons who are taking it seriously as a prophecy, but. To, to lay the foundation, the common thread amongst all of these identities worn by Saturn, Kronos, Baalhamon, El, Dagon, Asher, Enlil, Kumarbi of the Hurrians, Milcom of the Ammonites, who the Hebrews called Molech, is that they all had an underworld connection. The most well-known, of course, are Kronos and Saturn. And the story is uh, that uh, they once ruled, they over, they became the king of the cosmos by overthrowing their father, the sky god, and castrating him in the process. Around 1940, it was discovered in uh, Turkey that the ancient Hurrians had a very similar story with their father god, Kumarbi, who became the uh, king of the gods by overthrowing the sky god, Anu, and castrating him as well. And suddenly scholars realized, oh, wait a minute. This is older than the Greek version. The Greeks got this from the Hurrians, and the text that they had found was preserved by the Hittites. So uh, the Hurrians go back much, much farther. All of them connected to the underworld. The same story. They, in turn, were overthrown by their son, the storm god. The Hurrians called him Teshub, Zeus to the Greeks, Jupiter to the Romans, and banished to the netherworld. Uh, Enlil, likewise, was, uh, by the end of his career, was in the netherworld when Marduk, who had storm god attributes, even though he wasn't technically a storm god, took over in Babylon. El of the Canaanites, uh, his home was the uh, location of the, called the, the Two Deeps or the Double Deep, Baal, the storm god taking over. Same story, just repeated and told slightly differently in each culture. But the bottom line is this old god who had become the king by overthrowing the sky god, wound up in uh, the abyss, the bottomless pit, Tartarus. Well, in the Bible, we're told that there are angels who are currently in chains in Tartarus. Peter writes this in 2 Peter 2, verse 4, writing that, uh, for if God did not spare the angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell, except that the Greek word translated hell is Tartarosis. It's the only place in the New Testament that Greek word is used. The only reference to Tartarus yeah. in the Bible as Mike Heiser says, if it's in the Bible and it's weird, it's important. So That's we need to right. pay attention to this. Yep. So Second Peter 2, and then Jude makes reference to them as well. In Jude verses 6 and 7, uh, angels who had sinned who were in chains in gloomy darkness until the judgment. In the context of Jude and Second Peter 2, it's clear that the only sin, or that the sin of these angels who'd been punished was a sexual sin, and that uh, the only place we see anything like that in the Bible is Genesis chapter 6 the sons of God who saw that the daughters of man were fair and took wives of any they chose and created the Nephilim, et cetera, et cetera. This is the Mount Hermon rebellion that we're talking about here. So if we assume then that the leader of the rebellion named Shemiyaza in the book of First Enoch is the leader of the group currently in Tartarus, according to Peter, then it makes sense to connect Shemiyaza as the leader of this rebellion to the king of the Titans, who, according to Greek and Roman mythology, were the old gods overthrown by the Olympians and banished to Tartarus. So that's how, now again, it's a little little speculative. The the Bible doesn't doesn't spell this out, but I think there's good reason to connect these uh, these entities. So Saturn is Shemiyaza in this this theory. And like Shemiyaza, Saturn, king of the uh, Titans or the Watchers or the Apkalu, if you want to use the Mesopotamian term, currently in chains in the abyss. I have a, I have a question here, Derek, because going backward, right, to the to the Hurrians and, and realizing that this this story filtered downward, right, or, or at least through, through the ages, what do you make of the story of the sky god and then also the storm god overthrowing this? Do you think that's like a, like a, a heresy or, or a deception, or do you think there was actually something like infighting where Satan as the storm god, who we know to be Zeus and, and by those names, actually did war with Saturn or Shemiyaza, who's the head of the watchers. Do, do you think these things actually happened? Or do you think this was just one of those deceptions? Like we're, you know, like we're in Sumer and Mesopotamia, they put the serpent God as the creator God and they did all this sort of heretical deception from, from the enemy. But do you think some of the stuff actually happened? Like there was this inner warring between, between this faction of watchers that fell and 
Because I think that's all very, very fascinating that there's this same story and this castration and whatever that, you know, whatever we, mm-hmm. we want to glean out of that. But how do you interpret that as looking back at what and drawing the conclusions you have of who who Saturn really the origin story of who this who this entity is? My, my theory is this, that the sky god in these stories, uh, Anu in Mesopotamia and in uh, northern Mesopotamia, the Hurrian story, the Hurrians occupied the territory that's uh, roughly where the Kurds live today, northern Iraq, northern Syria, Uranos to the Greeks, Kalos to the Romans. I think that was the, the straw man that was set up by these um, fallen angels to explain away the fact that God, Yahweh, the creator, had kind of stepped back from creation. Not that he's not involved. In Deuteronomy 32, verse 8, as Moses is sort of retelling the history of the world to the Israelites, he said uh, "He said that uh, when God divided the nations, he numbered them according to the number of the sons of God. Now, he divided the nations after the Tower of Babel incident. Mike Heiser's done an excellent job of explaining this. Essentially, God saying after to- the Tower of Babel, which was an attempt to build a uh, an artificial mountain, as a point of contact between the spirit realm and humanity. You know, we don't want to deal with you, God. We want to deal with these other gods that we were working with prior to the flood, the ones who gave us all this great secret knowledge that we weren't supposed to have. God said, all right, fine. Going to divide you up, confuse your languages, and I'm going to place these lesser Elohim, angels, if you will, over the nations. And it's not a coincidence that the Canaanites believed that their father God, their creator God, El, uh, held court on Mount Hermon with his wife, Asherah, and 70 Mm. sons. The number 70 in the ancient Near East, not just with Israel, the Hebrews, but uh, all through the ancient Near East, was a symbol that represented all of them. You know, not one left out, the complete set. So they had a God who had, you know, put that in air quotes, if you want, a small G God who had taken the place of the sky God who had been in their fake news version, chased off, castrated. He's powerless now. He's gone. He's out of the picture. And now we've got this this new god, uh, Dagon or El or Enlil or uh, Kumarbi or you know Kronos Zeus or Kronos or, or Saturn. He's now in charge until the storm god shows up and the storm god, his son, overthrows him. Now, I think that is the explanation, the fake news version that explains why these old gods are no longer walking the earth mm. because they're now in Tartarus. Well, how do we explain this? They're, you know, they're still praying to Kronos or, or to uh, Saturn, but uh, he's, he's in the netherworld. Okay. Well, we'll, we'll say it was a rebellion. We'll say it was a, a civil war and that uh, uh, Zeus or Jupiter took over. I, I think that's, that that's my theory, but we can only guess right. what goes on in the spirit realm, but uh, that that's my theory now. To, to, but more specifically to your question, yes, I do think there's infighting that takes place in the spirit realm. They had the the hubris to think that they could somehow win a war against God. Why wouldn't they fight with each other to see who was going to take over his throne once yeah, they? Yeah, we kind of talked a little bit about that with Brian Gadawa. In his recent book, he was saying he had Egypt and Persia fighting, and and there wasn't a lot of harmony going on. Mm-hmm. And maybe you're right. Maybe they were kind of competing. So when, when Saturn or Shemihaza gets deposed and sent to Tartarus, right? Does then is that when Zeus, Satan, then sort of assumes that role? Now that he's now this king is deposed or the leader is deposed, and now Satan says, "Now I'm in control." And, and, and is that what we're seeing too when we talk about this age of Jupiter and this age where now that he's locked in Tartarus, now this entity is locked in Tartarus, this one who led the rebellion. Mm-hmm. Now we have sort of like this new. The new dude, the new the new king or the new leader. Maybe I have this wrong. Is is that this? Is that is that the Satan? Is that Satan or, or the or the entity that, that that Jesus identifies as Satan? Yeah. Because Satan is is not in Tartarus, obviously, because he's he's left to roam the earth like a roaring lion and all these things. Right. So is that where is that? Am I correct in in, in those two things there? In understanding sort yes. of the, the way yes. that this this occurred. Yeah, and the way I explained it just a minute ago may have, may have uh, confused some because I, I got events out of order. I mean, obviously, the uh, the banishment of the old guard, the, the watchers from uh, Genesis 6, the sons of God, uh, they were banished to Tartarus before the Tower of Babel incident. It was after Babel that God said, okay, these new gods, these new Elohim, you know, B'nai Ha Elohim will uh, essentially administer earth on my behalf. You'll deal with them instead of me. And those were the entities, I think, that... Uh, became the new uh, pantheons of Mesopotamia and Canaan and Greece uh, and, and uh, Rome and so forth. 
So, uh, but they had to come up with a story to explain away, uh, you know, the, the, well, the sky God, Yahweh, he's, he's out of the picture. He's gone. He's, he's powerless. He's been castrated. Um, and, and now these are your entities, these, these gods here, you know, Baal and Astarte and Reshef and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, they've taken over these old gods are down in the netherworld and, uh, you know, they, you know, you, you can summon them from the netherworld and uh, ask them for favors, but uh, you got to go through these rituals. And that that's a good chunk of the book is dealing with that because that's a practice that the Hurrians really invented. Um, the word that, uh, we have in English, the, the word abyss actually, uh, we had assumed, or I'd assumed for many years came from the uh, Sumerian word abzu, but it turns out, uh, in, in doing some reading guys who've been uh, studying this their entire careers that, uh, it's actually the Hurrians and their necromantic ritual pit, the Abi that appears to be the source of the Sumerian word abzu. So the Hurrians, Northern Mesopotamia actually appear to be the source of this. And the thing that startled me after Sharon put me out of this research was tracing the Hurrian culture backward to find that it originated in the middle of the fourth millennium, fifth millennium BC, around 4,500 BC on the Ararat plain. Hmm. I mean, the Ararat plain that's below the mountains where Noah's Ark came to rest. And these are the ones who brought this practice of digging a ritual pit and summoning entities from the netherworld, which frankly continues to this day. And so those are the descendants of Noah that are out there. Trying yeah. to co- trying to contact these old gods from the before the flood that God just rescued them from, or at least exactly. a gen- at least a couple generations away from them being rescued from. That's fascinating. That's one of the questions I had actually in reading the book. Derek was, we know these entities do biblically speaking are in the abyss. They're chained in the abyss underneath the earth. They're locked in this prison for their for their wickedness, and yet they continue to have influence. And, they, and like you talk about, they, they get they're able to be summoned. Like, can you talk us talk to us a bit about how that how that happens? How they like how these things continue to have influence even though they're imprisoned? Yeah, and mm-hmm. maybe how the ancients channel that because I think that's all really interesting stuff. I hadn't that kind of made my mind blow a little bit thinking because you you think you know that right? You know that the evil has its influence even in the world today, but they're like you know it's like they're calling from jail like they they, they but they're able to somehow. Yeah, I think that's the uh, the closest analogy. I mean, how is it a mob boss or a gang leader can still influence what happens out on the streets? You got minions, right? And according to the Book of Enoch, and this was the er- this was the understanding, the universal belief of the early church, the early Christian church, for the first four centuries after the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus, was that demons were the spirits of the giants, the Nephilim, destroyed in the flood. And according to Enoch. These spirits were condemned to wander the earth, tormenting humanity without incurring judgment. That was sort of like the penalty on humanity for agreeing to their terms. Yes, we will trade you the women's for the secret knowledge. These demons apparently still have contact with their parents down in the abyss. That's now again, this is speculation because the Bible doesn't tell us. We don't know for sure, but that would be the only explanation that makes sense to me is that they're still in contact with these entities in the abyss and running messages back and forth. 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 Hmm. We were talking about that on our episode with um, a previous guest, and we had a long conversation about <laughs> the disembodied spirits and the, the whole idea of what disembodied actually means. And he was saying, he had some I- weird, wild ideas that seraphim can actually put their spirit in other entities as well, but also be in a, di- a different location. It gets harder and harder to understand. I, I want to ask you a question kind of about the Golden Age to kind of go back a little bit. It seems as though on our show we've been kind of laying out that the Golden Age was the closest to, I guess, their idea of utopia, their idea of perfection. And slowly, like the sands of time, this knowledge has been just draining out. And so this new age that's coming, is it just going to be like a, like you're saying, it's the reboot of the Golden Age, but is it's, it's, it's sort of morphed in with modern day technology as well. What do you see coming and, and how does it emulate sort of the original Golden Age? Like what, what's coming around the bend, hmm. sort of, so to speak? 
Well, I think it'll be a lot like the original golden age, which uh, the reason it was the reason God had to send the flood. It was becoming hell on earth. Yeah. One of the things that blew our minds, Sharon and I produce a weekly Bible study called the Gilbert House Fellowship. We just sit down and go through the Bible verse by verse. And we read through it in chronological order, which is kind of interesting when you get into the time of, uh, you know, Saul and David, because then you're starting to skip back and forth between first and second Samuel, first and second Kings, and then the Psalms and then back and forth. But it gives you an interesting perspective on uh, what was going on. As we were reading about the flood, notice that in Genesis seven and eight, the, uh, the Ark of Noah was on the water for 150 days. I just kind of filed that away. It's like, okay, interesting detail. But there's nothing that's included in the Bible that's by accident. Well, when we get to the end of the Bible, in Revelation chapter 9, there's a character called Abaddon in Hebrew, Apollyon in Greek, which just means the destroyer. He is the king over those entities that are in the bottomless pit, in the abyss, those locust-like things that come out and torment humanity, uh, all of those who don't have the seal of God in their foreheads. And interestingly, and this we didn't notice this until we were going through our study, it's like, wait a minute. They get five months. Do you remember where we saw that period mentioned before? Flood. Numbers in the Bible are often symbolic. The number three, the number seven, the number 10, the number 40, uh, 100. Those are often used symbolically. Uh, the number 70 representing all of them. But the number 150, which in a 30-day lunar calendar equals exactly five months. Hmm. It's like, oh, okay. Yeah. So these entities who led this rebellion that created the giants and for their rebellion were punished by being sent into the abyss, the bottomless pit, were there watching helplessly in chains for five months while their children, the Nephilim, were destroyed in the flood of Noah. At the end, they get out for exactly five hmm. months to torment humanity, hmm. those who aren't sealed by God. Uh, it's not a coincidence. It's a bookend event. Those are the same entities coming out who went in in the flood of Noah. And this is one of those details that uh, you tend to skip over if you're not reading the Bible out loud. Sharon and I recommend this to everybody who asks, uh, read it out loud because that forces you to pay attention to details that you otherwise just skip right mm. over. It's like, the, yeah, well, they talk about the, being like the days of Noah. And then it really is, a, it's, like a, it's, a, it's like a reciprocal or a mirror image, right? You have this whole, right, what right. happened before will happen again. And, and it will be not a golden age. It will literally be hell on earth because as Revelation 9 says, people will seek death, but death will flee mm -hmm. from them. And the interesting thing about that is that the Greek word death is thanatos. That's the name of the rider on the pale horse in Revelation 6. That was an entity. It was a god of death. Wow. It, the Greeks knew him very well. So they will seek the god of death, and he will. Sorry, I'm out of here. Yeah, the the golden age is kind of a deceptive. You know, it's it's sort of tricky when you say that. It is because it's, it's like a it's golden in one sense because there's this technology, but it's morally bankrupt along with this technology. So you have this advanced knowledge, but it's godless. So it is hell on earth. And that's where we that's where our society is right now. That's how it feels like we're moving towards. Like we're we're so advanced in our technology, but we're more and more godless every day. I've gone back and I rewatched the uh, the very short lived series Caprica, which is the prequel series to Battlestar Galactica. Yeah. Because it uh, tells the story of the creation of the Cylons, the uh, murderous artificial intelligent robots that uh, wanted to destroy humanity. But there was a theological thread that was all through Battlestar Galactica. And uh, in Caprica, it's there as well. And uh, what it does is it shows, unlike Battlestar Galactica, which is humanity desperately trying to survive against these, these murderous Cylons, Caprica shows a, a human civilization that is just so wealthy, it is basically pleasuring itself to death, similar to the Netflix series uh, Altered Carbon, mm. where they'd figure out how, figured out yeah. how to grow clones that were identical. You basically, if you were rich enough to buy clones and you were smart enough to regularly back up your memory, you could go do anything. Okay. You do something stupid. You get run over by a bus. No problem. You just take your memory chip or what they call it a stack and put it in a new sleeve, a new body. And there you are. Mm. So what you had was essentially eternal life, but because there were no consequences for your actions, mm. it was hell on earth. Caprica, the same way people had figured they'd uh, developed a virtual reality that was um, lifelike, immersive, almost like the holodeck on uh, Star Trek, the next generation. But hackers had figured out how to create a secret virtual reality where anything goes. And in the very first episode, they uh, showed this nightclub where, you know, as much as they could get away with on network television at the time, but they showed a virtual 
human sacrifice to the god Hecate or the goddess Hecate, uh, the goddess of the underworld. We are moving in that direction where this type of virtual sin people will engage in thinking that there are no consequences to it. It's not really real. Well, is it or is it not? I mean, what happens to your spirit when you're participating in this virtual bloodletting? I mean, you could even ask that question about people who really, really enjoy torture porn films like, uh, you know, the Saw series, for example. Um, hmm. that, that's where we're going. I mean, we think there are no consequences to it because it's all virtual. It's, uh, you know, technology will eliminate the risk of poor choices, but, uh, yeah. radical life extension without, uh, with unregenerate hearts that that's hell on earth. Yeah. D- Derek, one, one of the, one of the things that, that I, that I, I would love to just to kind of just to walk through a little bit here, because, because we're talking about the second coming of Saturn and we are now in this, you know, as you said, in the age of Aquarius and the age of Saturn and, and, and the occult and, and, and the elites and all this stuff on the, on the, you know, all these powers that be like, how, how we're Americans, so Nate and I, a lot of people listen to our show are Americans, but not, not everyone, obviously. And so there's a very interesting connection to America in your book. And, and I would love to talk just a little bit about that because it's a lot of symbolism stuff that being an American, I, I knew a little bit about, cause I, you know, seen the, the fall brothers belly, of the beast and knew some of the symbolism and the, and the masonry stuff that was there. But I would love to talk about how that relates specifically to Saturn and the things that are going on in, in America that seem to be ushering in or looking to this return of, of this entity, because I, it was, it was eye opening, and you wrote this. I would love to have you walk through a little bit about that because I, I just think people need to understand this I think People need to understand the symbolism, what's going on and what, what some of the dark forces, dark people, and dark things in, in, in this nation are, are really looking for and trying to make come about. And before I get to that, I think one thing I thought was really interesting was that Molech is one of the names and the entities that is really just a, a refurbishing of Saturn. And we see Moloch in, in the Bohemian Grove, and we see Moloch as being this god that people burned and sacrificed their children to. And it's... In some ways, it's still happening in, in the Bohemian Grove with our elite class. We know that Alex Jones got in there. If you want to, mm-hmm. Say what you want about Alex Jones, but he broke he broke in there and saw this whole thing happen, and we know what's going on. And and, and you broke down some of the symbolism and stuff in, in these most sacred places, and I use that sort of in in air quotes here in in our country. And I'd love just to talk a little bit about that. I think would be just is it's fascinating. Well, credit to Tom Horn who really broke the ground with uh, Apollyon Rising 2012 and seeing the 2016 Sharon spotted some of this too. And she uh, kind of directed me again, you know, she's the smart one in our house. <laughs> Molech. Yeah. That was an interesting connection in, in finding that uh, it, it's well known to, to Bible students that uh, Molech and Milcom are the same entity. Milcom was the name of the chief, excuse me, the chief God of the Ammonites. But uh, a scholar recently did a, a study of the, uh, the Ammonite, uh, what they call the onomasticon, the, uh, the collection of names that they've um, found from uh, Ammonite texts and in the ancient world, almost everybody had a name with a theophoric element or a god name as part of the name, but they couldn't find any Ammonites with Milcom in the name. Well, Milcom is just uh, is similar to the Hebrew word Melech. It just means king. So, okay, it's a title. The number one most popular theophoric element among the Ammonites was uh, Elu, which is their form of the god El. So El who we, uh, you know, as I go through the book, I showed that it was well known in the ancient world. El was Dagon, was Enlil, was Kumarbi. They, they all knew this was the same entity. Mm. Apparently, Milcom, who the Hebrews called Molech, was just another version of this same entity. So keep that in mind. Same entity, Molech, Saturn, Kronos, Baal Haman. Child sacrifice should be no surprise then. Saturn, Kronos, Baal Haman all accepted child sacrifice. And of course, the Bible is full mm. in the Old Testament of God warning the Israelites, do not pass your children through the fire to Molech. What surprised me was realizing that all of this was connected to the practice of necro- necromancy, summoning spirits from the netherworld. Mm. When you see it, uh, there's warnings against contacting Molech. It's always in the context of uh, uh, trying to uh, ask the, the underworld gods for favors. Well, this is the entity who secret societies have been working toward bringing back and welcoming when he shows up. And the art and architecture of the United States Capitol has this imagery all through it. And and again, credit to Tom Horn for being the first to spot this. You know, he wrote about the great seal of the United States and how it cites Virgil's fourth eclogue, Novos Ordo Ordo Secorum, New Order of the Ages, comes right out of eclogue four. So crazy. 
Henry Wallace and George and uh, uh, Franklin Roosevelt, who were responsible for putting the unfinished pyramid, the the reverse of the Great Seal, on the back of the dollar bill, and then Roosevelt taking the uh, front side and the back side of the symbol and reversing them so that the unfinished pyramid is on the left, which makes it look like that's the more important of the two symbols. Why? Because according to Henry Wallace, this represents the United States assuming its position as the new capital of the world, at which point the grand architect would return and the all-seeing eye would be fitted to top the Great Seal Pyramid as the apex stone. This is what they're looking for. Now, how does this fit in with the United States Capitol? What surprised me was discovering that the United States Capitol is called the Capitol, not because that's what uh, you call the building where your legislature meets. In 1799, that wasn't true. There was only one building on earth where a legislature met in a building called a Capitol. That was uh, the Virginia legislature in Williamsburg. But Thomas Jefferson, as they were laying out the plans for the new Capitol of the United States, it's Capitol with an A-L, Washington, D.C., the uh, architect wanted to call the place where Congress met Congress House. Jefferson insisted on calling it the Capitol because that's the name of the Temple of Jupiter in ancient Rome. The Temple of Jupiter Optimus mm. Maximus was the Capitolium. Mm. And it turns out it was called the Capitolium because it sat on Capitoline Hill, which in turn was called the Capitoline Hill because when they were digging the foundation for the Temple of Jupiter, they found a severed head. A well-preserved severed head, which apparently in ancient Rome, uh, especially for the Etruscans, who were like the northern neighbors of the Romans, and the king of Rome at the time was an Etruscan by the name of uh, Tarquinius uh, Superbus. Uh, he, uh, uh, the, the, the Etruscans considered the severed head a good omen. It was uh, how you communicated with the dead. This is a whole concept again, this idea of talking to the dead. So because of this, uh, this omen, which they said was a good sign for the future of Rome. They called it Capitoline Hill. They named the temple the Capitolium, and hence the United States Congress meets in a building called the Capitol. Now, I don't think Jefferson was a Jupiter worshiper, Satan worshiper. I think he was just trying to evoke the image of Republican Rome because the idea of a republic was kind of a novel concept in the, uh, you know, the early 19th century. This was not a new right. thing, or which was not a common thing around the world. Most uh, countries in the Western world were still ruled by monarchs, but there it is. And as they built the capital, did a couple of things that were really interesting. They wanted to build into the um, crypt, which is the main floor of the capital, a chamber into which the body of George Washington would be on permanent display. And Martha apparently agreed to this, but then the War of 1812 interrupted, the British burned the building. And so that delayed things long enough that uh, George's descendants said, no, that's not going to happen. But the plan was to put George's body on display in a, a room off of the crypt with a, a hole in the floor, a hole in the ceiling so the people in the rotunda, the floor above, could look down and see George's body down below. Now, what's the significance of that? Underworld. Yeah, well, exactly right. In the 1860s, <laughs> they uh, commissioned a painting for the uh, the underside of the dome. Now, the the Temple of Jupiter in ancient Rome did not have a dome on it. That was the uh, the the uh, the Pantheon in Rome, uh, which was uh, dedicated to all of the gods of Rome. But there was a, a hole in the ceiling. Uh, it's there to this day, covered with plexiglass now. But uh, essentially, that uh, opening to the sky represented the portal mm. through which the spirit of Caesar would ascend to become one of the gods, apotheosis. Mm. Likewise, there is an oculus or an eye on the underside of the Capitol Dome in the United States. Now, it doesn't open to the sky, but the painting that was put up there in the 1860s by Constantino Brumidi shows George Washington becoming a god. It is called the Apotheosis of Washington. And I argue in the book that the symbolism, the way George was portrayed with the purple cloth wrapping his legs, purple being the symbol of royalty, and the fact that his legs were completely wrapped is reminiscent of the way the statue, the idol of Saturn, was displayed in ancient Rome, where his legs were wrapped in wool, except during the one week of the Saturnalia in December, representing his confinement in the netherworld. So if this had all come about the way it was intended, you would have George Washington in the crypt with an oculus leading through the rotunda and then another oculus leading up to the dome and the painting depicting George Washington becoming the head of the Pantheon. 
and ruling over a golden age represented by the signs or the uh, scenes painted around the outside, agriculture and commerce and uh, industry and so on. So I think that is uh, the symbolism that we've got there. And I think Tom Horn was right. The obelisk and the dome representing the, uh, say, generative power of the uh, male and female uh, was right on that secret societies, the Freemasons in particular, Wow. Wanted this to represent the uh, creation or the engenderment of a uh, the return of this entity. Where Tom and I differ in opinion is that he believes it's the Antichrist. I think it's bringing back this entity who led the initial rebellion at Mount Hermon. Tom calls him Apollyon. I just don't think Apollyon is the Antichrist. I think Apollyon Abaddon is Saturn, Shemiyaza, the destroyer. They're come, they're being released from the abyss in Revelation, right? Like Right. Yeah. Yeah. And this, this 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 obelisk and dome symbolism is all over the world. I mean, yes, there's a very famous obelisk and dome in uh, Vatican City at St. Peter's Basilica, but look at just about every mosque on planet Earth. Mm. So one thing is it's confusing. It's like when people come on our show, a lot of people, they don't think there's actually a Satan. Some people, that's been very hotly debated on our show. Is there actually one leader of all these? Are there multiple? I think Brian Godawa was talking about this a little bit. And they all have different names. So I, that gets really confusing for me personally. I'm just always kind of like, I don't, mm -hmm. how do I keep track of this? How do people listen to our show, keep track of this? Is there, is there a simple explanation for what do you, what, what do you think is important? What, <laughs> what are the characters we should know? Yeah, I about? wish there was. <laughs> yeah. I think as you know, uh, Chuck Missler said that uh, it's, it's likely that uh, we lost access to um, probably, you know, six higher spatial dimensions when we got kicked out of the garden. Uh, and so these entities are at a, a distinct advantage, which I think is why God told Moses, don't consult with necromancers or mediums. Do not try to consult the spirit realm because we're not equipped to deal with these entities. I mean, mm -hmm. Paul wrote that even Satan appears as an angel of light. John wrote that we are to test the spirits for not all are from God. We see into this room as, uh, in the words of Paul, as though, in, as though we're looking into a glass darkly. In other words, we're looking into a mirror in a darkened room. So everything is backwards and dimly lit. So we're only getting glimpses, shadows and shapes. And we're trying to make out, you know, make, draw conclusions from what we cannot see clearly. Uh, are there 200 as the book of Enoch suggests? Don't know. The book of Enoch was not in the Bible. It's not part of the canon of scripture. So we can't take it as 100% accurate for sure. The Bible doesn't tell us how many there are. Yes. We know from the new Testament and uh, again, we have to read carefully because there are just some clues here and there. When Jesus is uh, confronted by the scribes and Pharisees, and he's accused of casting out demons by the power of Beelzebul, this is in Matthew 12, uh, Beelzebul means Baal, the prince, as in Baal, the prince of demons. Jesus responds by saying, if uh, Satan cast out demons by his own power, how will his kingdom stand? So we know that by the New Testament period, Satan has a kingdom. Yeah. And of course, during the temptation in the wilderness, Satan offers all the human kingdoms of the earth to Jesus if he would just bend the knee. But when you go back into the mm -hmm. Old Testament, Satan is not even a proper name. It's Ha Satan, the Satan. It's a title. Like accuser, it's like um, right? the accuser, the adversary, uh, the prosecuting right. attorney. It's a job description. It's possible that more than one angel had that position throughout history. But by the New Testament period, it clearly was a proper name. Jesus used it as a proper name, and he said he had a kingdom. In the book of Revelation, it appears pretty clear that Satan is the leader of this rebellion in the end times. But there are a couple of other interesting entities that we read about in Revelation. The beast who emerges from the sea. Sharon and I are going to write a deeper study on this at some point, probably not this year, maybe next year, the beast that emerges from the sea. The sea in the Bible often represents chaos, primordial chaos. The fact that this entity has seven heads, 10 horns, suggests that we're looking at the same primordial chaos monster that shows up in ancient Mesopotamian stories uh, going back to the middle of the third millennium BC, where a, a warrior god had to, had to defeat a chaos monster or chaos dragon in order to um, establish the, the known world, uh, the natural world for humanity. Uh, this was called Tiamat by the Sumerians, Yam by the Canaanites, Typhon by the Greeks, Leviathan in the Bible. Leviathan. 
So we argue that the spirit of Antichrist that emerges from the sea, from the abyss, from chaos in Revelation uh, 13 is Leviathan. So he's got a role to play. But when you look at uh, Ga- or the Gog-Magog war, we argue that Ezekiel 38 and 39, uh, that war ends in Ezekiel 39 with Armageddon. And we go into explaining why that is in my book's Last Clash of the Titans and uh, Giants, Gods, and Dragons. So Leviathan, Antichrist, Gog, appears to be the commander-in-chief of Satan, the leader of his army, going into battle at Armageddon. You've also got the woman in red, the scarlet woman, uh, Mystery Babylon, who shows up in the book of Revelation. Sharon has made a really good case, and I think she's right about this, that this is the ancient entity called by the Sumerians, Inanna also known as Ishtar to the Akkadians, uh, Astarte in the Bible, or Ashtoreth. She went by a number of different names, Aphrodite to the Greeks, uh, Venus to the Romans. She thinks that she is going to run things in the end times, I think. But then the 10 kings who serve the beast will turn on her and they will burn her and devour her flesh, which is interesting because uh, these entities have had us humans burning our children to them as sacrifice. Now they're going to turn on her in, uh, in Revelation. And then you've got this uh, character called the, the Destroyer, Abaddon or Apollyon, who I argue is Saturn, Kronos, Baalhamon, et cetera, et cetera, Shemiyaza. What was really interesting to me was finding this uh, connection between the, uh, the Mount of Olives and Revelation 9 and uh, the emergence of this entity in Revelation chapter 9. Uh, Solomon was coerced or cajoled or persuaded to build a high place to the Ammonite god Milcom, Molech, on the Mount of Olives. Now, if you've been to Jerusalem you, you, and visited the Mount of Olives, you see that you are 200 feet higher than the Temple Mount, which is just across the Kidron Valley. So you're looking down from the Mount of Olives onto the Temple Mount. So Solomon goes and builds this temple to Yahweh, the creator of all things, who personally appeared to Solomon after the temple was built. I mean, that would be an event you would think you'd remember. (laughs) And yet, toward the end of his life, he builds these high places on the Mount of Olives to the east, which is the direction that the doors of the temple open. So you look out from the temple and you're looking out at the Mount of Olives and seeing the high places there for Astarte, Mystery Babylon, the war god Chemosh, who is later known as Ares and Mars, and Milcom, King, El, Molech. And because of this, in the in uh, Second Kings, we're to, we're told that the priests referred to the Mount of Olives as the Mount of Corruption. But when you look in the Hebrew, it's uh, Har Ha Mashkith. Well, Ha again. That's that uh, definite article. The Har Ha Mashkith, Mount of the Corruption. When you look at the Hebrew English dictionaries, you see that Mashkith is often translated as destruction or destroyer. So I asked our friend Rabbi Zev Porat, um, Har Hatmoshkith, could it mean Mount of the Destroyer? And he said, hmm, yeah, that would uh, be an accurate interpretation. So I argue that uh, this, be- because of the high place there to this entity, El Saturn Shemiyaza, that the Mount of the Destroyer was the Mount of Olives. And I think that's why Jesus spent so much time on the Mount of Olives during the final week of his life. He was, yeah. uh, he, he gave the, uh, the Sermon on the Mount there, during which he revealed most of what we know about the end times. I mean, Jesus, most of Jesus' pronouncements about what would happen in the end times were there on the Mount of Olives. He was arrested there in the Garden of Gethsemane. He was crucified on the Mount of Olives. He was buried there, resurrected there. According to 1 Peter 3, he descended there from the Mount of Olives into the abyss where he proclaimed to the spirits in prison who were imprisoned when they formerly did not obey in the time of Noah. In other words, he was talking to these same entities, El, Shemiyaza, Saturn, Kronos, etc., declaring victory. And in 1 Peter 3, 19 and 20, Peter connects this to baptism. Mike Heiser did a wonderful teaching on this during our tour of Israel back in 2018 at the Jordan River, which was awesome. This is why we baptize. Every time we baptize, we're declaring victory over these entities that are still chained up in the abyss, just like Jesus did during the three days that he was in the ground. During the three days that he was in the ground. During the three days that he was in the ground. During the three days that he was in the ground.
It's like, oh man, okay, I'm getting in the Jordan River now. And then, of course, Jesus came back and ascended from the Mount of Olives. And according to Zechariah 14, he returns to the Mount of Olives. And I think that's because this entity convinced Solomon to place his temple there and called it, you know, the Mount of the Destroyer. Don't you think it's interesting, Derek, that, that Jesus went to Mount Hermon and then also went to the Mount of Olives and he yes. stood on those places and, and basically declared his victory like o- over these mountains, high places, these places of, of defilement. I, exactly. I love this, Nate. Like, I, you know, you read the Bible, you grow up in church and you get all this stuff. But you, you don't understand. Like, I don't think until you peel this back, you understand like the supernatural implications of the things that Jesus was systematically taking authority over and undoing in the midst of this, uh, of this ministry. You know, he's given this amazing sermon, right? This, the Mount, the sermon, the Mount of Olives is this defining part of his ministry. And at the same time, he's like stepping on the head of the, of the enemy at Mount Hermon and, and at, at the Mount of Olives and, and, and basically declaring his sovereignty over the, the old gods or the, the, these that have, that, that essentially had, had taken, taken and enslaved, you know, his creation. Mm-hmm. It seems like there are always these tit for tat things. Like they do something here and then, you know, something else happens here. It's like, kind of like it, it, <laughs> it reminds me of the playing that game risk where you're just like, you, you go back and forth, you go back and forth. And then finally someone at the end just takes over the whole board and wins. Right. And it seems like there's these territories in these areas where it's, it, everyone comes on and gives us another clue of like, well, this is what actually happened here. Didn't think about that on the Mount Mount of Olives. So we talked about the Transfiguration and Mount Hermon connection mm-hmm. and what Jesus does there. And then Jed talked about Caesarea Philippi and the gates to hell. Right. So this is the first time I've heard of the Mount of Olives being a significant location. G- Jesus essentially, after the Transfiguration, came down and then from there made his way down to Jerusalem. So it's he essentially sent a flare into the spirit realm on Mount Hermon. Mm-hmm. And then came to Jerusalem to fulfill his mission. Yeah. So uh, yeah, it was it was uh, okay. Here I am. What are you going to do about it? And uh, my guess is that the uh, the fallen realm assumed that because he was fully human, that he was vulnerable. So right. yeah, I mean, it was like like Paul wrote, uh, writes writes uh, if uh, the archons, if the rulers of the age had understood uh, the mystery that God was revealing, and I'm paraphrasing, uh, they would not have crucified the Lord of Glory. Jesus basically provoked them into fulfilling his mission. So someone said uh, in our member section, they asked if there was an inscription on Mount Hermon specifically. They asked about yeah. that. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, and I got to give credit where it's due. Doug Hamp in his book, Corrupting the Image 2, new information out of this text for the first time since it was found. Sharon stumbled across this. Now, it, this has been known to scholars for a long time. Sir Charles Warren who was a an engineer and explorer on behalf of the Palestine Exploration Fund, went over to the Levant back in 1869. And in uh, September of 1869, he climbed Mount Hermon. And in, uh, he, he found inside the temple on the summit, uh, it's a spot called Kasser Antar, uh, the highest man-made place of worship on earth to this day, 9,200 feet above uh, sea level. There's a, a Greek inscription on a, a slab of limestone about four feet high. It was about uh, uh, 12 inches thick, about 18 inches wide. And in the archaic Greek, it uh, read something like, by the order of the most high and holy God, those who swore an oath proceed from here. And uh, it, it was brought back to London. Sharon found this because she was researching her Red Wing novels, her R- Red Wing saga series. And that begins with the Jack the Ripper killings. Well, Charles Warren, 19 years later, 1888, was uh, superintendent of Metropolitan Police, Scotland Yard. So he investigated, led the investigation into the Jack the Ripper killings. This slab, this stone, was brought back to London by Warren and is at the British Museum now. It was not unboxed until about 1903. Wow. Now, in Sharon's series, it was unboxed as soon as it got back and something evil came out of the stone, but that's, you know, a uh, fictional account. But uh, <laughs> anyway, the significance of this stone, though, is that, uh, and scholars have recognized this for more than 100 years, that it, this is a reference to the Watchers. Now, the interesting thing is that the Greek inscription means it probably does not predate Alexander the Great's invasion of the Levant. So, all right, maybe 300 BC at the oldest. But still, think about that. Greek speaker 
in the fourth or third century BC, making reference on this inscription on a slab of stone that when it was 18 inches thick or 12 inches thick, uh, Warren cut it down to four inches to lighten the load. It still weighed a ton when he brought it down. So it weighed like three tons when he, you know, somebody dragged this stone weighing 6,000 pounds up the mountain, 9,000 feet and left it inside the temple. A reference to the watchers, something that happened in the pre-flood era. Now, where Doug Hamp did, I think, a brilliant thing is that he found the images of the stone that you can find online. Uh, British Museum has some high-resolution photos of it. It's not on display, by the way. We were over there in 2018, and we asked. It's, it's, you, you, can't, you can't see it. It's, it's hidden away. Um, mm. There are some words that were skipped over by the scholars who have translated it because apparently they couldn't make sense of it. And so Doug found a reference in this stone to a bull what appears to be a bull. He called it, uh, here, here's his new translation. According to the command of the great bull god, Batios, those swearing an oath in this place go forth. Uh, the significance of Batios is that it's a, it's a Hellenized or Greek form of a Sumerian logogram, Bat, which references the god Dagon or Enlil. The significance, of course, in my book is that I show that Dagon and Enlil and El are all one and the same. And now we've got a connection specifically putting Dagon and Enlil on the summit of Mount Hermon. But the great bull god Batios, I argue, is actually a reference to bull El. That was one of his main epithets is the Canaanite father god. It's uh, common, a lot of references in Canaanite literature to bull El. But credit to Doug in connecting El Dagon and Enlil on the summit of Mount Hermon, because since it was translated in about 1903, uh, there really has not been any new information. They've tweaked it here and there, but this is the first new information to come out of this inscription on the summit of Mount Hermon in more than a hundred years. That's crazy. Hmm. Derek, so we get, so this is the second coming of Saturn. So, so, so we've gotten all the way to, to the Mount of Olives. We know that <laughs> Armageddon happens, right? And, 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 Apollyon, who, you, who your book you surmises is Saturn, returns. I think it's fascinating that you talk about Armageddon. You believe it actually is Jerusalem. It makes a lot of sense scripturally not to be this obscure valley, but all, but instead to be a battle for the holy city. Mm -hmm. Talk about when he does return and this battle is looming. I mean, two things I would love for you just to kind of just expose on just a little bit is, you know, what, why, why is it Jerusalem one? And then two, when this battle happens... The Rephaim return and fight, mm -hmm. fight on the enemy side. And I just talk me through Jerusalem and then and then this sort of zombie entity possessed army showing up. This just feels like, apocalypse. Right, it really is. It feels like like this is like better than than any kind of Hollywood, you know, Brad Pitt, World of Z sort of movie. This is uh these are like the heroes, you know, the men of renown, as they say in, in the Bible, returning to finally try, you know, try their their best at, at Yahweh. Yeah. And lose. Well, in the 1930s, the uh, there was a scholar who published an article in the Harvard Theological Review. His name is Charles Torrey, T O R R E Y, and he showed that this um, assumption that Armageddon would be fought at Megiddo was mistaken. It really comes down to transliterating from Greek or from Hebrew into Greek, and then from Greek trying to figure out what the original Hebrew was, and then us English speakers trying to make sense out of that. He pointed out that. Uh, in Isaiah chapter 14, which is the famous chapter, you know, how art thou fallen, O Lucifer, son of the morning? He wanted to establish his mount of assembly or his throne in the mount of assembly in the, the far reaches of the north. The, the phrase mount of assembly or mount of the congregation is Har Moed, Har Moed. And this was believed to be the place where entities, chief entities held court over their, over their, their colleagues, the lesser Elohim, uh, the, the Har Moed of El was Mount Hermon. The uh, Mount mm -hmm. of Assembly for Baal was Mount Safon, which is uh, on the border between Turkey and Syria, right on the Mediterranean coast. Yahweh's Har Moed is Mount Zion, the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. And what Tori showed is that when you take this, this Har Moed, which features a character in the, the word Moed called the Ayin, which looks like a reversed apostrophe. It's uh, essentially a glottal stop. There's no corresponding sound or letter in Greek or English for the ayin. So when John was writing the, the battle of the Har Moed, the battle for the Mount of Assembly, he had to figure out, because he was writing in Greek, how do I translate this Hebrew phrase into Greek? Well, the closest Greek equivalent for the glottal stop 
is the uh, Greek letter gamma. Mm. So English speakers coming along, looking at the Greek New Testament. Okay, so this is Har Magidon. The gamma must refer to the Hebrew character gimel, which is the g sound that we have in English. So that's how we get Megiddo, even though there is no mountain at Megiddo. Megiddo is on the Jezreel Plain. There is a mound there, but that's what they call a tell. It's like 30 levels of civilization that have been destroyed and then leveled and built on again. The Mount of Assembly, the Har Moed, is at Jerusalem, and that's where the battle will be fought. And that's consistent with all of the apocalyptic prophecies in the Old Testament, like Zechariah, Joel, Amos, uh, and so forth. So the battle, the final battle of the ages will be fought at Jerusalem. And that then brings us to Ezekiel 38 and 39. And we show in uh, the book why we equate the War of Gog and Magog with Armageddon. Uh, there's, a, there's a verse in uh, Ezekiel 39 where uh, God says, they will know I am the Holy One in Israel. Uh, the Holy One of Israel is a phrase that you see often in the Old Testament, but the only place you see it in Holy One in Israel is in Ezekiel 39, where God is describing the end of the uh, the War of Gog and Magog. And so if God is on the battlefield, that's got to be the final battle. That's got to be Armageddon. Mm. And then later in Ezekiel 39, there's a description of a really gruesome sacrificial feast where the, the birds of the air and the beasts are invited to partake of the flesh of uh, mighty men and horses and warriors and so forth. This corresponds to a similar feast described in Revelation 19 after the battle of Armageddon. And, you know, we're not the first ones to spot this. Uh, Bible commentators for hundreds of years have noticed the parallel between the sacrificial feast in Ezekiel 39 and Revelation 19. It's the same feast. Now, I know that there are other prophecy teachers and scholars. Uh, Bill Salas, we've had discussions about this. He doesn't think it's the same thing. I, I do. We'll, we'll know in the end. I don't want to disfellowship or uh, unfriend anybody over this, but that's, that's <laughs> our belief is that Ezekiel 39 is uh, pointing to the same event as Revelation 19. But what's really interesting is that in Revelation 39, or rather Ezekiel 39, 11, I'm going to bring up the verse here, so I'm not trying to bring it up out of memory, where uh, God is describing the end of this battle. He makes reference to uh, entities that are called travelers. And uh, mm -hmm. I heard this on Mike Heiser's Naked Bible podcast some years ago, and I nearly ran off the road when he mentioned that, uh, <laughs> here, here's the verse, 3911, on that day, I will give to Gog a place for burial in Israel, the valley of the travelers east of the sea. It will block the travelers for their Gog and all his multitude will be buried. And then he mentioned just in passing, oh yeah, there's a reference to uh, travelers in the dictionary of deities and demons in the Bible, hmm. meaning that the travelers are not people on holiday on the King's Highway in Jordan. These are spirit beings. These are entities, demons. And so I started digging into that and found that the term traveler is one that is used specifically of the Rephaim by the pagan Canaanites around the time of the judges. There are several texts found from the ancient Amorite kingdom of Ugarit called the Rephaim texts, where they are summoned to a ritual meal at the threshing floor, the sanctuary, the tabernacle of El, which can only be Mount Hermon, where these warriors of Baal, as they're called, mount their chariots. They travel first one day and then another, and then they arrive at the sanctuary of El at dawn of the third day, mm. where the blessing oh. of the name of El will revivify or resurrect the travelers. So resurrected Rephaim. At dawn of the third day. Yeah. Yeah, which was exactly when Jesus was discovered, or the rather the, resur the resurrection of Jesus was announced by the angels who saw the women at the empty tomb. So mm. the travelers... The, the east of the sea is a reference to the Dead Sea. This is an area that was known as an area of spiritual activity. Sharon and I have done a, quite a bit of digging on this, and she she's done a study on Psalm 23 that is mind-blowing. We believe this is what was referred to in Psalm 23 as the Valley of the Shadow of Death. Yeah. Where God prepares a, a table in the presence of mine enemies. Why do I say this? That area... In the Exodus route, the stations of the Exodus named in the book of Exodus, a couple of them right before they reach this particular area, the area right across from Jericho, the plains of Moab below Mount Nebo, make reference to spirits of the dead. One is called Ovoth, which literally means 
spirits of the dead. Another one called Ai Ha'avarim means ruins of the travelers. Well, that area there, when you're looking down from Mount Nebo towards Jericho, at about the two o'clock position, there's a little hill that extends into uh, over the, uh, the, the valley below, which is uh, mostly farmland today. That hill is the location of a ruined city. Archaeologists today call it Tal El Hammam, but scholars from Trinity Southwest University have just presented within the last year scientific evidence that that was the city destroyed by a, an air burst, a meteorite exploding over the northern end of the Dead Sea right around the time of Abraham and Lot. 18th century BC. Mm. Wow. So, and at the base of this city, this uh, city that encompassed like 85 acres inside its walls, but for comparison's sake, Jericho at the time had about 10 acres inside its walls, 85 acres inside its walls, there were 1,500 dolmens along the, uh, the base of the city. Now, dolmens are these megalithic funerary monuments that look like tables, two big slabs of, uh, st of vertical standing stones, and then a tabletop slab across the top. Some of these dolmens that have been found in the Jordan Valley have uh, capstones across the top that weigh up to 50 tons. Mm -hmm. And there are more of them, more of them, these, these dolmens in the, do in the Jordan River Valley than just about anywhere on earth, but more of them concentrated at the base of what was probably ancient Sodom than anywhere else in the Jordan Valley. So you get, the, Moses and the Israelites get there and they spot all of these, these funerary monuments at the base of this ruined city on the hill. Okay, we'll call this place Aiha Avarim, Ruins of the Travelers. When Moses is told to climb Mount Nebo to get his only look at the promised land, Mount Nebo, in Deuteronomy it says, climb this mountain of the Avarim, this mountain of the travelers. That area was known as a place where these demonic spirits, and they're called travelers, by the way, because they traveled or crossed over from the realm of the dead to the land of the living. Mm. And, you know, this was known to the Canaanites, this was known to the Israelites. This veneration of those spirits was a snare, a trap, a lure, because 700 years later, Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 57, Isaiah chapter 65, was still having to write and condemn Israelites who were practicing these rites, you know, eating forbidden food among the tombs and summoning the spirits of the dead. This is where the final battle between the forces of Antichrist and God will take place right there. Right there. Right there. Right there. You have these you have these Rephaim travelers, yeah. These, yeah. These, so that are... the army of Gog, the army of the Antichrist, yeah, there will be humans involved, but I suspect they will be demonically possessed, and those will be the travelers that Ezekiel prophesied. Wow, that's crazy. Do you think that's? I mean, I always was fascinated by Psalm twenty three. It's probably the one Psalm that I've 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 uttered to myself in my life more than anything. Didn't realize that the valley of the shadow of death. What he was actually specifically talking about is. You think that's where maybe Jesus went? In the wilderness? Well, it could be. I think uh, he went into the Judean wilderness, which was south of there, but um, it's believed that that may be the place where he was baptized. And uh, oh. what's interesting, too, is that uh, that's where Moses died. Moses was buried in the plains of Moab, but nobody knows where. But Elijah, the other prophet from the Old Testament who was with Moses on Mount Hermon during the Transfiguration, Elijah was caught up to heaven right there he had just crossed over from jericho so he was there in that same place it sounds like there's a portal there <laughs> exactly i mean it's crazy i mean yeah right i mean you have all this, this connection this between traffic. The, south end of, the south end of the jordan river which empties into the dead sea right there and the jordan river which emerges from mount Hermon. so yeah so if you go, if you go hiking out there make sure you don't go alone right <laughs> you know walk into something you don't want to walk into make sure you're prayed up every location every place yeah. jesus goes every Every area and territory is significant. Mm -hmm. Why do you think all this knowledge is lost upon humanity? What happens? Why do, I, I don't know. It just seems like and that's what's so hard for modern day people when they go back and they read the Bible like this. They just, they can't even begin to 
understand the way ancient people thought about things, the way they, the locations, the significance, and just the pagan rituals that people participated in. And even the Israelites got seduced to, like you were just talking about, Mm -hmm. themselves. And so we, it's, I just wonder what, why, where's the disconnect? What changes? How come it always feels like you're, in modern day times, you're arguing with people like, hey, this is how ancient people used to see the world. And we all just think it's make believe and fantasy. Well, we we can't discount the uh, influence of these uh, principalities and powers. I mean, Paul wrote that uh, that's who our real enemy is. We're not wrestling against human opponents, flesh and blood, principalities, powers, cosmic rulers over this present darkness, doctrines of demons. They're whispering in our ears, and there are some people who are actively inviting that uh, mm. uh, that interference in their lives. Augustine in the early fifth century, brilliant man. But he was the one who was probably most responsible for shifting the course of Christian theology away from this understanding that the pagan gods of their neighbors were real but fallen angels, and that demons were the spirits of the giants destroyed in the flood. Mm. The Jews of the Second Temple period, the early Christian church, they understood this clearly. You can see it in the Septuagint translation where words like Rephaim are translated as uh, gigantes, giants, or in some cases, titans. Mm-hmm. So they understood the connection between Greek religion and the, their Hebrew religion. The early church likewise understood, you know, Zeus, Apollo. Yeah, they're real. They're just fallen angels. We get it. But for some reason, Augustine had a problem with this and he tried to move us away from this understanding. He was the one who popularized an idea that had been really proposed about a century earlier by a guy named Julius Africanus that the sons of God of Genesis 6 weren't angelic beings. Those were the righteous sons of Seth. Yeah. And so the giants, the men's, they were, they were the, the mighty men who were of old. Those were just uh, uh, evil rulers who uh, were dictators and, and uh, tormented their people. Augustine wanted to Christianize a practice that was never really stamped out of the church. This, this idea of ancestor veneration. We really went into that in our, our book, Veneration, uh, the monthly ritual performed by the Amorites, the Canaanites to uh, feed the ancestors. And I put that ancestors in air quotes because, again, they were dealing with demons, not uh, the spirits of their ancestors. But every month on the 30th, they had to have a ritual meal where they would summon the ancestors by name, feed them. That's what the teraphim were used for. You know, the household gods that uh, Jacob's wife, Rachel, stole from her father, Laban. That's what those statues were used for. You take a little piece of bread and smear it on the statue. That's how you fed the statue. Hmm. And then you'd pour out water on the floor to uh, give them a drink. They have found graves in, in Amorite houses because most of the dead were buried beneath the floor of the house, I guess, so they didn't have to travel so far to get to the meal, with libation tubes. So you would pour the water into the tube so it would get right to the corpse. Because if you weren't fed and watered by your descendants after you died, you were condemned to eat dust and clay for all eternity. Now, suddenly, Abraham's anguish at not having an heir makes a little more sense. Anyway, this practice continued into the early Christian era, where people continued having ritual meals where they would summon their ancestors. And by the way, the parallel between what was happening on our streets here in the United States of these protests over the last couple of years, mm-hmm. say their name, say their name, and they would pour out drink offerings. It's the same ritual the Amorites were doing 4,000 years ago in Mesopotamia. Oh. Anyway, oh. the early Christian church, when built the first churches in Rome after Constantine legalized the faith, were built in cemeteries so that the Christians could continue having cemeteries here, grandma's here. Great. The church is right here. We can have the ritual meet. Go to church and then have the picnic on grandma's grave, summon her for the meal. Seriously. Hmm. A couple of decades ago, they were doing some archaeological work in St. Peter's Basilica, and the sarcophagus next to the one that's believed to hold the body of the Apostle Peter, a Christian sarcophagus, has a libation tube in it. That's wild. So... You know, basically in in a spirit of, I guess, if you can't beat them, join them, Augustine said, okay, well, look, the spirits of the righteous dead can intercede for us in the land of the living. In other words, he was trying to Christianize the Greek and Roman practice of hero worship, where you would offer sacrifice to Perseus or Theseus or Heracles, and then have them do something for you. So mm-hmm. that's where the practice of Praying to saints came from in the uh, Roman Catholic and Eastern churches, which continues to this day. It began with this whole practice of ancestor veneration, which 
we traced back to the ancient Amorites and uh, through the, the Hurrians back to the Ararat Plain almost 7,000 years ago. Nothing's new under the sun, Derek. Nothing new. So under I guess the sun. we are still doing it. We just don't realize it. We we are. I mean, how many places you, you go into like a nail shop, or if you've got uh, friends who are from an Asian culture or uh, an African culture, even, you know, Mexico, the Day of the Dead, and uh, the veneration right. of uh, folk saints like uh, Santa Muerte. It's essentially yeah, the same or, thing. Or voodoo and, and hoodoo and, ha- right. and Haiti. They do. They do all kinds of. You know, they go to the graveyards and do. Exactly. It's, African it's, religions it's, like robots, it's, same thing. It's interesting, right? Because until you open your eyes to that, it, it just seems like some weird stuff. That, but it, it literally, you can draw it all the way back, all the way back to to Genesis six and to Mount Hermon, Mount Hermon, into the into the into the watchers coming down, and then to them creating, and really at the very essence to them wanting to be worshipped as God, as God, right. like God. Yeah, and and that's and where here we are. Here we are. The relevance to Saturn comes in because Saturn, as Shemiyaza, led the rebellion that created the these demonic spirits that uh, are still influencing the world today and doing the work and preparing the way they think for the return of their uh, the return of the Watchers. The mic drop. We wrapped it up with a bow. That was, <laughs> I mean, yeah, and and then, and then the, the the amazing thing, and I love this too, is that he Saturn will return. And he gets to reign for 150 days. Exactly. And, and that that's it. You spend all, all of time in Tartarus to come back for a flash in the pan before you get squashed by, by Yahweh, by God of Israel, which is Amen. kind of awesome. It's just awesome. Like That's oh, it. And, the, and that's where I hope when we, we write about this stuff, I hope that Sharon and I convey the good news and, and the hope in all this, because it can be tempting to try to feed the the adrenaline rush that some folks get when they read end times prophecy and like oh the nephilim are coming back well no the nephilim are here they've always been here they've never left they just they're not in physical form they're demons so the nephilim mm-hmm. are they've never gone away the watchers yeah they're coming back but like you say they get 5 months at the end and anyone who's got the seal of god on their foreheads is protected i don't think the church is going to be here sharon and i believe in a pre tribulation rapture but even if not you know, if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you've got that seal on your forehead, and these things can't touch you. So that's the good news. Yeah. That's the good news. The good news. You don't have that's to deal with news. any of these things. Mm. So that's, yeah. you know, yeah. Uh, and, and maybe if there's any fear that we engender with the, the books that we've been writing and the research we've been doing, hopefully it will encourage those who've not yet made a decision to accept Jesus Christ to do so. Yeah, It's a real war. The reason he had to go to the cross and sacrifice himself mm. is to save us from these entities who want to kill us in everything that we love. You know, we love it. We love it. You guys, you guys bring all the brains and the research to the, to the conversation. We, we bring all the, the silly memes to, to the conversation. <laughs> you, you, you know, you got the brains and the bronze. There's uh, room for the memes. There's room for the memes. There's always room for one more meme, right? Yeah. yeah. You guys dominate the meme first. You guys are the golden age. We're down in the bronze age, just <laughs> picking stuff off the ground. We don't know what we're doing. Well, Derek, uh, thanks. Thank you. I mean, th- thank yeah, you, thank thanks. you, thank you for the for for that. Um, again, um, tell everybody the book is the second coming of Saturn. It's your, it's your newest book. That's something where they can. We already talked about where you can find it. Tell them where they can where they can find the stuff that you you and Sharon are putting out there, where they can engage with you. I know you've got some fantastic resources. You guys put a ton of work into content. Tell everybody about about that because our, our listeners out there, like Derek, Derek and Sharon do this all the time. So there's there's so much more than to to dive into. You know, on biblical prophecy. I know you guys went through Revelation. You guys have a Bible study. I'll let you do it. You're better than me. But, yeah, thank uh, you. Talk gracious. about where people can find you and the th- some of the things you guys are working on. Well, our weekly yeah. Bible study, GilbertHouse.org, is where you find that and. Uh, uh, that really is what has led to the research for the books. We get into the Bible, reading it verse by verse. It's like, hey, wait a minute, was that always in there? And we've had a lot of those moments over the past, gosh, when did we start this? 2014. So almost seven years now that we've been doing this. We just posted episode number 330. We've been all the way through the Bible once. We're going back through it again, finding things this time that we didn't see the last time through. And uh, it's about one hour a week. And you'll find that at gilberthouse.org, which also links to our other websites. Sharon's website for her writing is uh, SharonKGilbert.com. I post a lot of stuff at my site, DerekGilbert.com, which is uh, uh, some Skywatch stuff. I've been posting a lot of uh, excerpts from the book, which uh, Tom Horn 
graciously has been allowing us to share for free. So if you want to try before you buy, you can find, I think we just posted episode uh, 18, 18 chapter length uh, excerpts from the book already out there. We'll have probably twice that many by the time we're done, which will be almost uh I don't know, three quarters of the book or more. you find that at DerekPGilbert.com. We also produce a couple of weekly television shows for Skywatch TV. Unraveling Revelation, which is a, a weekly half-hour study on the book of Revelation, but end times prophecy in general. We started with Genesis, because if you don't understand what this war is about, Genesis 3, Genesis 6, Genesis 11, even Genesis 1 and the uh, sub, uh, subduing of Leviathan, then the rest of the Bible doesn't make any sense. So unraveling revelation.tv for that. And uh, at the beginning of, uh, well, actually, it was, it was last fall, we started uh, The Bible's Greatest Mysteries, which allows us to explore stuff like uh -huh. this. And God bless him, Tom Horn is now putting it out on network television so uh, people can watch it on uh, the PTL network oh, awesome. on Fridays and on Sundays. But we post the episodes at Bible's Greatest Mysteries TV, Bible's Greatest Mysteries TV, and we're just in the middle of a series of four episodes with uh, Ellie Marzuli on that. And following that will be four episodes with Dr. Doug Petrovich, who's got a brand new book called Origins of the Hebrews, and he shows hard oh. physical evidence that's been overlooked by Egyptologists for years, proving that the Israelites, the Hebrews, were in Egypt. He's translated inscriptions that make reference to Joseph, to Joseph's sons Ephraim and Manasseh, and probably a reference to Jacob as well. So um, yeah, this is a follow-up to his previous book, The World's Oldest Alphabet, which shows that Proto-Hebrew is the world's oldest alphabetic script, not Phoenician. So uh, wow. yeah, we're digging into stuff like that and looking forward to possibly a okay. tour of Turkey in the Churches of Revelation in the fall and Gobekli Tepe. So, man, oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, we are blessed to do what we do. Gobekli Tepe, we talked to, we, we talked, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's fantastic. We talked to Dr. Judd, Judd about Gobekli yeah. Tepe. Uh, that's fantastic. Love awesome. to get him out there. Okay. Yeah, thanks, Derek. Well, thanks, Derek. Yeah, yeah, get, yeah, get old baby. Judd out there. And thanks yeah, for putting our, that. thanks for snapping a photo of our shirt and promoting us to your, your fans. Oh, yeah, yeah. man. Thanks for always being honored. Here. Honored. Thanks for, yeah, as always, thanks for your time and, and coming on and, and being a part of what we're doing. We totally appreciate the time and, and, and the knowledge. And Yeah, man. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank Happy you, to thank do you. it. Any time. All right, Derek. All right. Thanks, Derek. Bet. So Sharon yeah. said hello. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely.